So now I actually want to, to, to move away from some of the things that were really personal for me and talk about predicting the pre presidency. Of course, um, now the presidency is over, maybe you guys find this a little bit less interesting than it would have been before, but I, I think it's actually really fun <coughs> to think about how it is that all these pundits were out there trying to predict who was going to get, who was going to get elected to be President McCain or, or Obama. There was one poll, um, uh, the Mason-Dixon poll, that found that Obama was ahead of McCain in Virginia by two percentage points. So let's just assume it was 51 to 49. Unfortunately, there are also these undecideds. So um, I'm just going to assume it was 51 to 49. The margin of error was four percentage points. And what that means is that if you had 100 polls, 95 of them would find Obama's support somewhere between 47 and 55 percent. Okay? So a lot of reports claimed they were head-to-head, -head, and others said that Obama's ahead. And the kind of question, like, what do we mean? What can we really interpret out of this? And the way, one way to interpret it is that if they, in fact, were equally supported, there's only a 31% chance we'd see a poll like this. So it's not a whole lot of information. But that's, that's really the most accurate thing that you can say. So what problems do we see with polls? Um, I mentioned already a lot of people claim to be undecided in a poll. Um, and that, that could be a problem. What if they're undecided because they actually think that the pollster really supports one of the two candidates? Um, that happens a lot if you have a kind of generally view, con uh, viewed liberal. So say if the Washington Post calls you up and you're a McCain supporter, you may feel like, I don't want to talk to this guy, but I'll, get, you know, I'll just say I'm undecided, when in fact you're really leaning towards uh, McCain. All right, who are the likely voters? One of the things that happened um, with this particular president that presidency is that young people who had never voted before were really, really charged. Okay, so a lot of the traditional polling methods would say we're going to try to figure out who's a likely voter by saying who voted last election. Well, then you're going to keep everybody out who's under 22, and a lot of people who were so charged that they might have been 46, but it was the first time they were going to bother to vote, right? And again, though, that can happen on either side of the, of the aisle. Um, who is polled? Again, this was another problem that really had to do with young people and people who are likely to move around more. Um, they don't even have landlines anymore. And this was the first election where Gallup poll actually started really, they started actually sampling cell phone users and said that it was the first time that cell phone users could make a difference. Before, there was like, there are so few cell phone users, uh, they, they can't make a difference. But they said this time they could. Margin of sampling error. I want to actually give you a story for this one. So I recently read in the press an article um, about a survey that was done of uh, 250,000 uh, doctors in the United States. And 49% of them planned to uh, cut back or close their medical practice. And they cited a whole range of problems from bureaucratic n details that they didn't want to deal with anymore, Medicare not paying enough, and you know, all sorts of things as to why they're very unhappy with the profession. Now, they even pointed out, I had a statistician on there, I don't know who, this guy, who gave this guy tenure, saying the margin of sampling error was 1%. Well, it turned out that their survey had a 4% response rate. <laughs> okay, so people who were close to retirement or who were very angry, they were probably much more likely to respond. And to talk about a sampling error, so what is a sampling error? A sampling error is, given a sample, how likely is this that it represents everybody? Now, if you have, <coughs> if you do a poll um, of, say, presidents, most people actually do like to respond what their presidential choice is, and they're not so picky about who's asking them the question, as I was su suggesting earlier. Um, so the margin of sampling error is actually a calculation that's done entirely based on how many people respond to you. So you, if you see a lot of these articles in the news that say, you know, with a three, the margin of error is plus or minus three percentage points, um, that's a calculation that's done based on how many people responded to the poll. But a different question is, was however many that was, what percentage is that of the whole population that I tried to sample? Okay, and unfortunately in this case, that was a 4%, and that suggests a huge amount of bias, and talking about margin of sampling error is just inappropriate in this context. So bias in the question itself, um, that can happen a lot. A lot of these polls, when people try to figure out what Americans think about abortion, for example, that's a great one where the way you ask the question really changes how those statistics come up. 
There's no uniform system for voting, so that affects who will vote, which votes count. Um, that's a, a big one when it came uh, to concerns that people had before the election, that there were certain places in the country where people were going to potentially have to wait for many, many hours to vote. Would they vote or would they not? And if this happened in predominantly poor areas uh, where people predominantly supported Obama, would that affect the outcome? So that was a big concern. Um, and uh, are people truthful? Of course, you know, you might, especially this happens a lot with exit polls. When you see these things, the exit poll didn't agree with what the outcome was. And there's a lot of suspicion then that there was some um, uh, corruption in the outcome of the actual result based on exit polls. And maybe the exit poll people are actually lying to you because they don't want to talk to you. So let me talk about some other methods aside from polling that you might predict something like the presidency. Psychics, I, got, I saw a lot of them um, online talking about their methods, and um, the stock market was a good one, I, so that the stock market was somehow a model of, of dissatisfaction with Bush. Um, inflation rates and growth of the economy, good news. Oh, the kids had a vote, sorry, that just the up doesn't care, doesn't work. Vote by kids, you know, in the school they have these scholastic votes. Um, they've gotten the votes correct except for twice in the past 50 years. Um, what divorced women feel? This was my favorite one. There was a big article about how divorced women were going to change the, uh, were going to affect it. Um, social web data. So what's going on about internet uh, queries? So how many queries are about Obama versus how many queries are about McCain? Um, polls, of course, you mentioned, pundits. Um, and I want to tell you my favorite way of predicting anything, which is my magic coin. So I have this coin. It's really great. It tells me the pre presidency in any given election with a very simple rule. If it's heads, it's Republican. If it's tails, it's Democrat. You might not believe in my magic coin, but let me tell you, it's actually worked 15 out of the 17 past elections. It's a pretty good track record, right, for my magic coin. I bet you're impressed. If I just did that by chance, I would only have a 0.1% to do so well. That's like one in a thousand, right? But let me tell you how I found it. I did the following thing. I, I got together a thousand of my best friends, and I had them flip the coin 17 times. Okay? And the first time they write down heads, the next, you know, if it's a heads, tails, they write down 17, and then I matched it up with the presidents of the past 17 elections, and I chose the best one. Right? It's the best coin. So it turns out. I had about a 70% chance of finding someone who got it all right among those 1,000 people who flipped that coin 17 times. So it's not surprising now that I have a magic coin, but you might still be suspicious as to whether it will work next time. <laughs> right? Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But then there's this question, what does that actually say about regression analysis? So what's the idea of regression analysis? It's that we look at past behavior. Um, and we try to find a statistical model that models it well, that predicts well past behavior. And then we say, this is going to be a really good predictor of future behavior. Now, unlike a coin, you usually put variables in your regression analysis that you have reason to believe will be related to the outcome. So for example, um, I was reading a story about some regression analysis done on Bordeaux wines. And this guy got together a model in which he predicted how good the Bordeaux wines would be based on how dry the climate was, what the rainfall was, and other things that in fact do impact quality of wine. And then, uh, and of course, all the wine experts were very dismissive, saying you couldn't possibly do what we do with a regression analysis. And in fact, he predicted better the following year what the Bordeaux wines would be like than the experts had. Based, they, they, the experts do it based on tasting things from barrels early in the, in the aging process, okay? Um, so, but I do think that we give quite a lot of um, weight to model regression models when, unfortunately, there is this element, which is, well, did they just get lucky? Did they just choose the best model out of many models that they chose that modeled the previous data the best? Is it like my magic coin, or is it actually something that tells us something about the future? <coughs> 